Justice and righteousness. These are two things that God is paying attention to in this time. We need to pay attention to God. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembert. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We're looking at the Word of God and hopefully encouraging all of us to get closer to the Lord. Very, very important. Corey and Ryan are here. Corey, what's going on? I'm taking a look at Isaiah chapter 28 and the city of Samaria. Ryan? I have a really interesting question for us today. How could a good God, a God of peace, according to the book of Hebrews, condone and even employ warfare? Does God make war? Very good. 20 minutes, those two pieces are coming up, so make sure you are there as well. Janice? Who or what is your refuge? All right. So we've got a lot going on today. So this is a good day to join us and be a part of this program. Let's open up our Bible guide and open up the most important book of all, the Word of God, the Bible, and let's study. Isaiah 28, verses 16 through 29. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Also, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters will overflow the hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overflowing scourge passes through, then you will be trampled down by it. As often as it goes out, it will take you. For morning by morning it will pass over, and by day and by night. It will be a terror just to understand the report. For the bed is too short to stretch out on, and the covering so narrow that one cannot wrap himself in it. For the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perizim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his awesome work, and bring to pass his act, his unusual act. Now therefore, do not be mockers, lest your bonds be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a destruction determined even upon the whole earth. Give ear and hear my voice, listen and hear my speech. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clods? When he has leveled its surface, does he not sow the black cumin and scatter the cumin, plant the wheat in rows, the barley in the appointed place, and the spelt in its place? For he instructs him in right judgment, his God teaches him. For the black cumin is not threshed with a threshing sledge, nor is a cartwheel rolled over the cumin. But the black cumin is beaten out with a stick, and the cumin with a rod. Bread flour must be ground. Therefore he does not thresh it forever, break it with his cartwheel, or crush it with his horsemen. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. Isaiah chapter 28, verses 16 through 29. Isaiah 28 and 29, this is what we read as we go through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. And we do that every year, and this is exciting because we're reading the prophetic book. Christians recognize that each person is called by God in some way. Even the actions of people intent on evil will be used by God to accomplish his work. There's a lot that we don't see in our reality. It's easy to see the actions and results of human free will. 
but harder to see God's hand always at work. In the end, we will all be judged by what we have done in this life and what we have decided about God. I mean, what do we do about Jesus Christ? I mean, he's in front of us right now. Did we truly come to know and follow him? Or were we reconciled to God through him? Well, these are all our choices. We either follow our sinful selves and stay slaves to sin, or we follow God and become his followers. Amazingly, when God takes our case, we are saved every time and given the gift of eternal life with the Lord. I want to say that again. When we follow God, he takes our case. I guess in some ways it's like asking somebody ultimately to take your case. So when Jesus Christ looks at us, looks at me, fortunately, he doesn't see all my work, but he sees God's work in me. That's really important, you know. Take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. This is a great one. We're going to focus on Isaiah chapter 28, verses 16 to 29. And as we read this, read from it, allow it to change your heart. Father, I pray today that that we would allow you to change us and help us today. There's a lot of people, Lord, with a lot of answers, and they have the answers to everything. They really don't. You have the answers to everything. Father, you are not even in this world, except through your Holy Spirit, God's presence in us. Show us your ways and teach us your paths as we go forward. In Jesus' name. And we said together, amen. Now, if you don't have a Bible guide, write for yours. Call us or write us, or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and get it there. You can download it just as we have it here. Isaiah 28, 16. Here we go. Are you ready for this one? Because this is good. Isaiah speaking. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Also, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness, rightness with God, the plummet. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters will overflow the hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overflowing scourge passes through, then you will be trampled down by it. As often as it goes out, it will take you for morning by morning. It will pass over and day by day and by night, it will be a terror just to understand the report. This is incredible. Justice and righteousness are two things that God will judge us on, beloved. Now, Christians have given their lives to follow Jesus Christ and do what he says. So believers in Jesus Christ, that's what we do. We seek justice. We seek righteousness with God. Actually, we seek righteousness with God first, and then God helps us with justice with each other. Jim Canelon, who is a program we do here, it's excellent because he focuses on that intensely as he teaches through the Gospels, Roman and Acts. He says, justice with God and then, or justice with man, but just righteousness with God and justice with man. That's the important thing to remember. And beloved, that's exactly what he's saying here. Now, learn more from Isaiah 28, 20. It says, for the bed is too short to stretch out on and the covering is so narrow that one cannot wrap himself in it for the Lord will rise up as Mount Perizim. He will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do what his work, his awesome work, and bring to pass his act, his unusual act, awesome work and unusual act. Now, therefore, do not be mockers, lest your bonds be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord God of hosts, a destruction determined even upon the whole earth. Incredible. The second point, the earth and time will be judged by God. Time will also be judged by God. Everything will. 
Christians know and understand that God will judge. Now, we may not understand how God does everything, but we know that God is the creator of time. So he actually brings everything back into under his realm. But remember, sin has taken everything out. And we as believers in Jesus Christ have said yes to the Lord. And when we said yes to the Lord, there's some things that happen to us. One of the things is we, we take our life and we say, Lord, our life has to be set in front of you. And so we do that. And God helps us to make decisions in our life that are good for us. You know, we, we, we don't live for ourselves. We don't live to eat. However, we do eat to live. You know, television is amazing and, and it motivates us in many ways, but we need to pay attention to what God says. Isaiah 28, verse 23. <laughs> Give ear and hear my voice. Listen and hear my speech. Does the plowman keep plowing all day to sow? Does he keep turning his soil and breaking the clods? When he has leveled its surface, does it not sow back common and scatter the common? Plant the wheat in rows and barley in pointed places and the spelt in its place, for he instructs him in right judgment. His God teaches him, for the black common is not threshed with the threshing sledge, nor is the cartwheel rolled over common. But the black cumin is beaten out with a stick and the cumin with a rod. Bread flour must be ground. Therefore, he does not thresh it forever, break it with its cartwheel or crush it with its horsemen. This also comes from the Lord of hosts, who is wonderful in counsel and excellent in guidance. God has shown us how things develop. And the farmers did this. They moved things as God called them to do so. It is God who is moving time. And Christians understand that the Lord is moving very fast at the end of time right now. God teaches us. There are things in place that he gives us. And things are in place right now for a change in how we see things. My question is, have you seen God? Have you seen the Lord? Do you see Jesus Christ? He's in front of you. It's not me. The Lord is in front of you. He's not of this world. He is God of heaven and earth. Jesus Christ, who came in this world, died on the cross and rose again after three days. Keep that in mind, because if you give your life to Jesus Christ, you mend the relationship with the Lord. And suddenly you become a follower of God. That's very important today. Hi, Rod Hember here. We go through the Bible every year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now you can join us and watch at the time you like by searching Bible Discovery TV on the Roku box or on Amazon Fire TV. Anytime you want to watch us, we're there. Get a hold of it. Watch us anytime you want to. Carrying on with our study, today I want to deal with a question that comes up a lot as we read the Bible, especially for skeptics and or new readers of the Bible. And that is, how could the God of the Bible, a God the Bible calls good, as well as a God of peace, condone and even employ warfare? Now on the surface, this may sound contradictory. I mean, a God of peace at war? Well, actually, God's goodness and peace demand that he be at war, at least for now. Let's study. Both saints and cynics alike have often struggled to understand how the good God of the Bible, a God of peace, could condone warfare and even lay out specific instructions for how wars ought to be fought. Interestingly, Old Testament scholar Gleason Archer responded to this question with a question of his own. He asks, is it really a manifestation of goodness to furnish no opposition to evil? Can we say that a truly good surgeon should do nothing to cut away a cancerous tissue from his patient and simply allow him to go on suffering until he finally dies? Can we praise a police force that stands idly by and offers no resistance to the armed robber, the rapist, the arsonist, or any other criminal who preys on society? How could God be called good 
if he forbade his people to protect their wives from ravishment and strangulation by drunken marauders, or to resist invaders who have come to pick up their children and dash out their brains against the wall. It's hard to imagine how any deity could be thought good who would ordain such a policy of spiritless surrender to evil as that advocated by pacifism. Such humanitarian protests against our Creator also illustrate the sad fact that many people, including even some believers, don't really know who God is because they do not know His Word. As a result, they have created either a partially or else a totally false image of God. In an ironic twist, they have created God in their own image, and in doing so have actually broken the first two of the Ten Commandments. To be sure, He is a God of peace, as affirmed by the New Testament book of Hebrews. But the Bible also calls him most upright and holy, and as such he cannot tolerate sin. He's also called the judge of all the earth, and the lawgiver. In fact, he's even referred to as a warrior in Exodus chapter 15 verse 3. Thus his character demands that he must judge and conquer evil, for there can be no real peace in the midst of evil and suffering. In another sad twist, many believe that God is the one responsible for evil and suffering. This is the natural conclusion that flows from the popular belief that creation came about through evolutionary processes, where life arises through death. According to evolution, death, suffering, and evil have always existed. However, in direct contrast, the Bible teaches that God created everything perfect, but man rebelled against God, which brought these evils in. So God is not responsible for evil. We are. Nevertheless, God, in His grace, has been working to bring all of creation back to its original perfect state. And that's why the God of peace is at war with all evil. So notice that there are three points we considered here. The first was, could a good God really allow evil to go unchallenged? And the obvious answer to that is no. Second, a lot of people don't really know who God is because they don't know His Word, the Bible. You know, we fashioned a God of our own making in our minds, but we need to know the God of the Bible. That's part of the reason reading and studying God's Word is so, so important. Lastly, because we live in a sin-cursed world, God has to bring all evil into subjection. He is at war with evil because He's working to restore creation to its perfect state. Also very important to understand is that God is not the author of that evil. That false idea comes from an improper worldview. But the Bible teaches that evil entered in as a result of our disobedience to God. Nevertheless, God, in His magnificent and unmatchable grace, gave Himself for us in the person of Jesus Christ and offers you eternal life in a new heavens and new earth, just like it was in the beginning. But the question is, will you accept His offer of salvation? It's a free gift, but you have to accept it. it accepting it means that you pray. And when you pray, uh, you simply close off everything else. And that's why people close their eyes. And that's why they fold their hands, to keep their hands from being uh, involved and keep their eyes closed and pray and say, God, I believe that you died on the cross. You allowed yourself to be killed on the cross by us. And you rose again on the third day. And I believe you paid the cost of sin, my sin. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. I say in Jesus' name because his name is the strong name. That, I mean, nobody can match that name. Very interesting. Corey? All right. Well, we are going to be taking a look at Isaiah chapter 28. And, and God does something really interesting here. This is a prophecy against the northern kingdom of Israel that's going to fall to the Assyrian Empire during Isaiah's lifetime. Um, and its capital city was Samaria. And, and God likens the city of Samaria to a wreath or a crown. Uh, you know, verse one of 28 says, woe to that wreath, the pride of Ephraim's drunkard, to the fading flower, his glorious beauty set on the head of a fertile valley. And when, when we jump into this segment, you're going to see how Samaria was set up on the crest of a hill and how its walls very well could have looked like a crown. And what's interesting is that God says, I'm going to throw that city down and what's going to happen is God himself to the remnant who will return at a later date God himself will become a glorious crown a beautiful wreath for the remnant of his people you can read that in verse 5 so with that imagery in mind take a look at ancient Samaria 
First Kings 16 tells us that Omri ruled as king of Israel for six years in the city of Tirzah. Then, deciding on a move, he bought the hill of Samaria and built on it a fortified city that became the new capital of the northern nation of Israel. Samaria, as we have it today, has been excavated twice, revealing that King Omri's original palace was used not only through the time period of the kings, it appears to have survived the Assyrian takeover in 721 BC. The Assyrians, after a long siege, must have exercised great restraint in not destroying the city or palace. Instead, they added insults to the injury of their conquest, installing their governor in the old palace of the kings, a symbol of utter defeat for the Israelites. The palace then, without much improvement, lasted through the empire takeovers of Babylon, Persia, and into the Hellenistic Age. During the Hellenistic period, the city was eventually destroyed and abandoned, but it was later rebuilt by the Romans, and famously by Herod the Great, who built a temple to Caesar Augustus on top of Omri's old palace. Omri's palace occupied the very summit of the hill, the most prestigious place in Samaria. Partially preserved by Herod's temple, Omri's palace was built on a large square rock platform that he had made by carving away all the extra rock. It was a 13-foot high platform that was climbed via monumental staircase. Researcher Dr. Rupert Chapman believes that Omri built his palace in the style of what's called a window house. This means the palace would have filtered you into the throne room by way of a pillared, covered courtyard and grand doorways. The throne room would have been large, possibly two stories tall, with a raised center roof whose windows let in light. He also believes that palaces like these had a type of balcony window out of which the royals could present themselves to the people. Interestingly, a pit was found during excavations that contained ivories from the original palace. They're beautifully carved with animals, trees, plants, gods, and more, revealing why the palace was called the Ivory House. One ivory is carved with a known motif, the woman at the window. So again, here in Isaiah chapter 28, God uses Samaria uh, he talks to the people about how they have put, you know, Samaria is the crown of Ephraim, the pride, the joy. The people have put their hope, their pride, their joy, their confidence in their government, as in their kings, as typified by the city of Samaria. And that is not a good thing thing that will always bring you to a very bad place. It will always fail you, which is why instead God should become our crown, our wreath, meaning our joy, our confidence, our hope, uh, our trust is placed in God rather than in any government or any man or woman. Very good. Excellent, mm -hmm. Corey. Janice? That leads so very well into what I was going to say, Corey, with who or what is your refuge? You know, this chapter 28 of Isaiah is a woe to Ephraim and Jerusalem. And this oracle, oracle against the northern kingdom's rulers was to serve as an example to Judah's rulers. Listen uh, uh, to what is said about them in Isaiah 28, beginning at verse 14. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men who rule this people who are in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and Sheol we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. What a contrast. You see here that they have made lies their refuge, so you, they're, they're going to come under the cover of falsehood of lies and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves that becomes their refuge now let's contrast that to psalm 46 that says god is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble therefore we will not fear even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea what a difference that we see here uh, than making lies your refuge. God is our refuge and our strength. Psalm 91, one of my most favorite passages ever. Let me get through to it here in my Bible. I love my Bible. I know that a lot of people have Bible on their phones and that's great because you can carry it with you wherever you go. It's not so bulky, but I gotta tell you, I love my book 
Bible. Uh, I, uh, the kids were looking at mine earlier because it's coming apart. I can't find Exodus 4. It's in here somewhere because my pages are loose, but it's so precious to me. I have so many notes written in it, and I'm sure that you have one like that too. It's like your best friend, isn't it? Psalm 91, listen to this. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. And it goes on. You know what? I have a couple more seconds here. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you. Today, as we come to you, let's pray. And as we close in prayer, we say, Lord, help me to change my actions with your plan. Father, I need to get myself straight with you. Help me, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name. This is what we pray. Amen. Now, join us for the prayer meeting. If you're not well, or if you have some other things or some people to pray for, we'll pray for you 3.30 to 4.30. We're live on Facebook, YouTube, and Bible Discovery TV. Join us. We'll pray for you Monday, Wednesday, and Friday.